Hello, and welcome to the fifth annual One Crucial Thing. My name is Todd Fetterman, and I'm the Managing Director of North Coast Ventures. For those of you not familiar with North Coast, we're made up of over 400 individual investors across seven separate investment funds. We've invested in over 75 startups, with most of them being early stage, business-to-business, -business, software as a service ventures. Along the way, we've met a lot of interesting people and are pleased to have many of them with us tonight to share one key insight or one crucial thing that drives business success. Our lineup includes founders, CEOs, and business leaders from organizations of all sizes, from startups to publicly traded companies. The insights they share will address sales, marketing, leadership, culture, and more. Add it all up, and it's a masterclass to help drive startup and high growth success. After our last presenter, we will email a survey link to all the attendees so that you may vote for your favorite insight of the event. North Coast will make a $1,000 donation in the name of the winning presenter for the nonprofit of the winner's choice. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few thank yous. First, to our sponsor for tonight's event, the law firm of Buckingham, Doolittle, and Burroughs, a Cleveland, Akron, and Canton-based business law firm with a focus on our region. North Coast Ventures and a number of our portfolio companies have enjoyed working with Buckingham over the years, and we appreciate their support. I'd also like to thank North Coast Ventures Innovation Council members. These companies and institutions are strong supporters of the startup ecosystem here in Northeast Ohio. We have representatives with us tonight from several of these companies that will present one crucial thing, and we're grateful for their continued support. Lastly, I'd like to call attention to the Cleveland Video Company, which delivered the final product for tonight's event, as well as our recent annual meeting. With that said, let's get started. Hi, I am Mitch Kroll, co-founder and CEO of Findaway, a Cleveland-based digital media startup focused on audiobooks that was acquired in June of 2022 by Spotify. My one crucial thing is that all business growth comes from you and your personal growth during the journey. It's not about technology. It's not about your product or your sales or your earnings. The number one factor in determining business and startup success is your personal growth. Think back to the last 10 years, where were you? You were definitely in a different role. You probably had a very different family dynamic, kids, partners, spouses. Well, guess what? The next 10 years is gonna be the exact same for you and me. We are going to all experience massive change in our lives. And the way to drive success through that change is by focusing on yourself. How are you going to elevate your mindset, grow your skills, enhance your strengths and address your weaknesses? My suggestion, consume a lot of content, meet a lot of new people, focus inward, not outward. And as you grow, your business will grow as well. Every next level of your life demands a different you. So embrace the blank page because the future is not written. Focus on you. Enjoy the ride. I appreciate the time. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jamie Jones. And my one crucial thing is unleash your inner child. Be curious. Curiosity is a critical element of entrepreneurial success. Being curious about the world around you opens up the aperture of possibility. Ask questions like, why are pizza boxes square when pizzas are round? Why are school buses yellow? Good entrepreneurs ask questions like this continuously of the world around them, of their customers, and of their business. And what's magical about curiosity is there are other unintended positive consequences. In fact, when you're in a highly curious state, Ambiguity feels less like a threat and more like a learning opportunity. Being in a highly curious state results in us retaining more of the information that we learn. And curiosity can motivate empathy, helping us connect with others around us. 
All of us are born curious. It's innate. In fact, our peak curiosity comes at age four when we ask why all the time. But our educational system and the fact that we become very concerned about what others think of us reduces the number of questions that we're willing to ask uh, and the curiosity that we're willing to express. So I encourage you to embrace your inner four-year-old. Question the world around you. Question why things are the way they are. And when someone tells you, well, that's how we've always done it, ask why and question that orthodoxy. If you're looking for new entrepreneurial ideas, then consider starting a question journal. Make notes of the questions that you have about what's happening around you. This can serve as great fodder to spark a new idea that could change the world. So go out there and be curious. Hi everyone, I'm Cal Aldubabe. I'm founder of Pandata, a Cleveland-based data science and AI consulting company. And today I wanna to share a crucial piece of advice that I wish I could give to my younger self, the power of a graceful no. I realized early on that saying yes is saying no to something else. Yeah, I'll listen to that idea. Yeah, I'll take that meeting. We're conditioned to want to please, and as entrepreneurs, frankly, we like chasing shiny objects. Um, so how do we say no without actually shutting doors? Here's a simple example. As a consulting practice, clients ask us for things that are new and outside of our original agreement all the time. Here's what we say. Yes, that's a wonderful idea, and here's what it would take to bring it to life, and this opens up a whole new avenue. Uh, the client can reaffirm their original priorities, or we find a way to win together. Um, early on in Pandata, uh, we worked on some really exciting machine learning projects, a rarity in 2016, and we struggled to retain clients. I learned the hard way that many of these clients were enamored with the idea of AI and machine learning, but didn't actually need it. And so we introduced a fixed fee discovery engagement as a gatekeeper, and it weeded out clients that didn't have a strong value proposition um, behind their need to explore AI, um, or clients that didn't want to buy into the process it would take to reduce the risk of these projects. And sure, it reduced our opportunities at first, um, but the few clients that said yes to this were actually some of our longest term and most profitable partners. I'm humbled by the number of times I get asked to help out, whether it's to listen to an exciting new idea, help with a meetup, speak to students, volunteer as a mentor of coach. Um, but if I can't say yes these days, I offer alternatives, like what I'm available, what opportunities I'm best suited for, or if I think someone else might be a better fit. Now, here's the thing, for the wrong types of individuals, they just go away after that. But for the individuals that matter, they often respect that response, appreciate what I can contribute in the moment and keep the door open for us to win together in the future. A graceful no allows us to navigate a fast paced world while staying true to our values and growing and maintaining strong, healthy relationships in our community. I invite you to join me today in saying a graceful no and focusing and saying yes to the handful of opportunities where you can have the greatest impact. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, and my one crucial thing is using improv to build your way to success. This is a skill you're going to want in your toolkit um, as a business person. So what, some, what a lot of people don't know about me is I was a theater major in addition to a journalism major. Um, and so I learned improvisation. You may know it. You've probably seen whose line is it anyway. So I'm going to share with you some skills that you can bring into the business world from improv that will help you expand your toolkit. So number one, listening skills. Improv is all about listening. You need to be an active listener to what the other person is saying. So instead of thinking, what am I going to say next? Be an active listener and respond to what the person said. Um, in improv, we call those offers. When a person first throws out an idea, we use it as a building block to create a seed. So they create the foundation. Your job is to build on that foundation. The important thing is to be in the moment, to listen, and to build together with the partners in the room that you have. 
Body language is another important thing. You're going to get a lot of information from nonverbal cues. So you want to pay attention to the person's posture. Are they making eye contact? What are their facial expressions? That will lead to more collaboration. So pay attention to how they're reacting in those nonverbal ways. And finally, this one's the big one for improv. It's called yes and. It's the idea that you accept the idea being offered. So let's say we're in an improv scene and somebody says, let's go to the beach. Your job is to then build on that idea of going to the beach and say, and let's bring a unicorn with us. Well, now you're off to the races with that idea. You, the next person may turn around and say, and while we're there, let's get some ice cream for the unicorn. So you're building on this initial idea and taking it somewhere else. Yes, and allows you to do that. The last thing you want to do is when someone says, let's, let's go to the beach, you end up saying, I'd rather go to the museum. Well, that idea just died. So don't be an idea killer. Be an idea builder. Don't think of it as bad ideas. They're just bridges to good ideas. So explore, experiment, be a good listener, and learn yes and. Thank you for your time today. I'm Kevin Goodman. I'm the Managing Director Partner of Blue Bridge Networks. I chose corporate social responsibility and participating in the community and how that helps a company build standing and credibility in the marketplace. In, in the business world, people do business with people they know, they like, they trust. And when you're out there serving, it's an opportunity to gain that um, standing credibility in the marketplace by being known, liked, and trusted. When you're on the board and you're delivering, people will oftentimes look to you and see the passion and enthusiasm and your skill sets and think to themselves, hmm, if this person does this well on this board and delivers, we know what they do for a living and we need what they do. Imagine what he or she would do if we paid him for it. On the board, one of the great opportunities is meeting like-minded people who are focused on loving and serving, although in a corporate world, their avocation and their vocation have an opportunity to come together. And for me, many times I've met many, many mentors, if you will, through all the different boards I've served on and learned so much from so many people and so many skill sets that candidly in the day-to-day -day in my work, I might not have been exposed to otherwise. You know, sometimes I walk around the data center and I think different things. And one of the things I think about is where did these customers come from? You know, I'm looking, what would I do next to bring in more customers? And it's a huge percentage of those that are on my data center floor that we're serving that I've met through my work in the community. And that standing and credibility that was built provided me an opportunity to present an offering and to serve many of them for two decades ago. One of the beauties of participating in boards and in the community itself is that you grow personally as well as professionally. So the outcome isn't just driving revenue or growing your business, but it's also growing yourself personally and professionally. And again, in the cycle of things, people do business with people they know, they like, and trust. And what better way to become a better person, the better self, than to love and serve in the community. Hello, everybody. I'm Art Anton, uh, retired chairman, CEO, and uh, president of uh, Swagela Corporation, which is a $2 billion industrial company located here in Solon, Ohio. I'm now doing a bunch of different board work and a little private equity work and some public company board work. But what I thought I would talk about today is building organizational bench strength. I've seen a lot of different organizations and a lot of different companies in the startup phase uh, always looking, uh, often looking um, at their organizations uh, in a rear view mirror when it's sometimes too, a little too late. And what I would maybe want to have people think about is how to build the right organization at the right time. Uh, we all uh, that have been in organizations, especially, you know, large and medium sized ones, joke about, uh, you know, the uh, engineers with the uh, with the pocket protectors, the accountants with the green eye shades and the marketing people golfing and, 
and Boeing all the time. But the truth is all these functions have a meaningful impact on an organization. And uh, often I've seen a company, especially in the growth phase, look at their organization uh, after they've reached the next phase as opposed to before they've reached the next phase. So what I would like to just recommend is everybody think about what's the right organization structure at the right growth phase, at the next growth phase, and making sure you figure out how you're going to get those, those people in places, those processes in places before you enter the phase and before it's too late. Uh, certainly, there's certainly a lot of uh, ways to augment uh, full-time uh, employees with fractional CFOs and outsourcing, you know, digital marketing, et cetera. But unless you have a plan, I find that many entrepreneurs and, and people going through rapid growth uh, often stumble because they're held back by their organizational structure and thinking about these things too late. So what I would like to just encourage everybody is think about what's the optimal organization structure, the optimal people, and the optimal uh, way of doing business as they go through different uh, phases of growth and uh, um, organizational maturity. My name is Dr. Elad Granot, and I'm the Dean of the Bowler College of Business at John Carroll University. In today's fast paced business environment, there are many factors that contribute to success. However, there is one crucial thing that stands out above the rest, and that is the ability to adapt to change. Adaptability is not only about reacting to external changes, but also about being proactive and anticipating future shifts in the market. It requires a willingness to learn, to be flexible, and to embrace new ideas and approaches. Successful businesses know that they cannot rely on past success to sustain them. Instead, they must be constantly innovating and looking for ways to improve their products, services, and processes. This requires a culture of continuous improvement where feedback is valued, mistakes are seen as learning opportunities, and experimentation is encouraged. In today's world, where disruption is the new normal, adaptability is more important than ever. Those businesses that can't keep up with the pace of change risk being left behind while those that embrace it can thrive and grow. So if you want to drive success in business, remember this, be adaptable, keep learning, be open to new ideas, and be willing to take risks. With these qualities, you can stay ahead of the competition and create a business that is not just successful, but also sustainable for the long term. Our MBA programs prepare you to do that and to the future of business and teach you how to be adaptable in the ever-changing business landscape. To learn more and apply, please visit business.jcu.edu. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Yves Salty, and I'm a senior director at Microsoft uh, AI engineering team. And today I want to talk to you about one crucial thing to drive business success, and that is building and motivating effective teams. And to quote uh, Tina Fey, in most cases, being a good boss means hiring talented individuals and then getting out of their way. Uh, building a successful team is essential for the growth and success of any biz business, and uh, it's not always an easy task. And to make sure that we have efficient and well-running teams, we need to make sure that there is diversity. Diversity in terms of gender, race, age, background. It's a great way to uh, improve the decision making in the organization and uh, also helps with pro problem solving. Uh, the second piece of uh, building and motivating effective teams is around making sure everybody has a shared <clears throat> vision and mission. Everyone in the team should have a clear understanding of what the company is trying to achieve and how their role fits into the overall spectrum. Uh, the third element is around encouraging open communications, encouraging feedback, proactive feed feedback, setting really achievable goals um, so that uh, we have that kind of closed loop process to make sure that we continue to iterate and improve on. And the last piece is recognizing and uh, re rewarding su success, S uh, taking a pause, 
celebrating the su- success of the team, acknowledging the hard work, uh, acknowledging the alignment towards the North Star. And um, this creates a positive and really great motivating environment. So that's what I wanted to, sh- to share with you. One crucial thing around building and motivating effective teams. Thank you so much for your time. See you in the next one. I'm Ashley Rader Sell, and I'm the Director of Remote Workforce Solutions at Cleveland Clinic. In the past three years, our team has helped over 10,000 employees transition to long term, remote, or hybrid roles. And we're currently working on how to expand our use of flexible work practices to more employees. As I focus on workplace transformation, my one crucial thing for business success is workplace flexibility. We learned from remote and hybrid work that flexibility attracts and retains talent increases employee well-being, and improves productivity. But not all employees have access to remote work. The next frontier of workplace transformation is bringing flexible work practices to all jobs. Not just healthcare, but any in-person industry should be considering how autonomy and flexibility can be infused into jobs in a way that attracts and retains talent long-term. While we have yet to crack the code, here are a few best practices we've discovered across our organization. Flexible schedules, offering a variety of shifts and a variety of start times, or even offering full-time work over fewer days. Implementing flexible, human-centric absence policies that help people be successful. Some teams have found ways to share jobs, allowing part-time employees to stay in the workforce, while some teams have developed job rotations which allow for employees to vary their work and learn new skills. Even paid maternity and paternity leave practices give employees financial flexibility to recover and care for children during that protected time. These are just a few examples of the practices I'm learning about. Like remote work, not all forms of flexibility are available to all people all the time. But whether your company is fully remote, fully on site, or a mix of both, I challenge you to consider how much flexibility exists in your workplace and join me in asking, how can we bring at least one form of flexibility to every job we offer? Thank you. Hi, my name is Caleb Dumont. I'm the founder and CEO of Integrity Power Search. Special thanks to Todd and the team at North Coast Ventures for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all about one crucial thing that drives a startup's success. So my firm, IPS, we work with early stage startups to find and hire elite talent. We've been around 11 years. We've placed over 2,000 people at companies backed by Sequoia, Excel, General Catalyst, North Coast Ventures, and many other top investors. Our clients collectively have had hundreds of billions of dollars of outcomes. To me, the the number one thing that a startup can do to be successful is master hiring. After startups raise money, your next biggest problem becomes, becomes building the team. It turns out it's both really hard and really important to hire great people. In fact, it's probably the most important thing a founder has to do. The quality of your first 10 hires are going to set the tone for your next 100. If you hire B players to start, B players will tend to hire C players to look good. But if you insist on only hiring A players 10x talent, they will insist on only working with other A players. If you don't hire well, it decreases your chances of building a successful company. There's no way any one founder can build an important company by themselves. So get those early hires right, obsess over it. And that's my advice, my one crucial thing. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Musa Hakeem Jr., CEO and co-founder of Lazy Moose. And here's my one crucial thing to make your successful business even more successful. The second step in any successful business venture after gut-wrenching hard work is learning the problems that exist within your industry. 
Once you understand that these problems are the obstacles and challenges that your customers face, make it your mission to solve them. Now, solving these problems does not have to be complicated. It's about finding the most effective and simple solution for your customers. Focus on their needs and make their lives easier because at the end of the day, they're the most important. Assessing the situation and circumstances of these problems is the key to staying ahead of the curve. Innovation comes from emerging technologies and understanding trends, both short term and long term in your field. These are the tools that will give you the advantage you need. Well, what does this all mean? Whether you're a day zero startup or a Fortune 100 company, these are the tips that will drive you towards success. So let's follow these three things. Learn, solve, assess, succeed. Bye. I'm Kathy McPhillips. I'm the Chief Growth Officer with the Marketing Artificial Intelligence Institute. With 30 years of experience in the advertising and marketing field here in Cleveland, one thing I know for certain is that the marketing world has changed a lot. The landscape of marketing significantly changed with the internet, with social media, and now artificial intelligence. AI has been the most significant advancement in my career, and whether you realize it or not, in your career as well. For the past two years, I've had the privilege of working at the Marketing AI Institute where we are constantly exploring ways AI can grow and scale our business. And we love to pass that on to other businesses in the area, in the world, and across the country. I came onto the team not truly grasping how much AI would impact my job. AI has transformed the way our team runs our business from strategy to execution. My crucial thing for you today is that investing time in learning more about AI and piloting it is crucial to remain competitive in the market, not just in marketing, but across your entire organization. AI powered technology provides us with unique insights and data, allowing us to level up our work. However, with every new technology comes risks, and AI is no different. We run the risk of over reliance on and misunderstanding of AI. We have a responsibility to strategically introduce smarter technologies and be the stewards of this new world, protecting our customers and our businesses, and understanding the ethical implications of using AI in marketing. We have an opportunity to use AI to save time and resources to focus on parts of our job and lives that mean the most to us. Artificial intelligence is here, and now is the time to learn about how it can augment and improve the work your teams are doing. I encourage you to invest time in learning more about AI to discover its benefits and positive impacts on your business. Thank you. Steve Domingo, managing partner for Buckingham Dual and Burroughs. And I was asked the question, one crucial thing that drives startup success. And I consider that to be the most important item to be flexible perseverance. Of course, you need to have a business plan before you start down this path of a new venture. And the business plan would have your goals and objectives and action items. But keep in mind that along the way, you're going to have many hurdles that are presented as well as some positive aspects, negative aspects, even aspects of your ideal are gonna be turned upside down. But take all of that information in, it's valuable information and use it. All information is good information and you adapt as part of that flexible perseverance. You adapt and you continue to go down that path towards your objective, your ultimate objective, that goal working backwards from being flexible, but persevere. And as long as you're staying directionally correct with that goal in mind and making incremental gains, I'm confident you will meet your ultimate objective. Thank you for this opportunity. Hi there, I'm Lacey. Big thanks to North Coast Ventures for having me. One crucial thing for founders is that I believe the most valuable priority I've made as a leader is to intentionally invest in my culture. How you do that can seem a little nebulous, a little tricky, but in reality, the most effective method is to treat your culture like a product.
As a CEO of Zoco, I lead an embedded UX studio, and through our efforts working alongside product teams, I've realized that the core principles for product success are directly correlated to culture success. It's all about understanding people and how they make decisions and connecting the value that you provide to their authentic needs. So the good news is you already know how to do this. Steps to actually building your culture are one, defining what it even is, right? What is the product that you have to offer? And then how do you find product market fit? So you start by having deep introspection to define what is truly special about your organization. Why do people work for your company today? What values do you have as a leader? And then who cares about those values? Because like your product can't serve everyone, neither can your culture. Once you go through this work, findings will emerge that you can start to define for who you actually are. And from those, you can test and learn to see if you're right. You can build experiments to see, you know, do these things actually matter to our users, our employees? And do we actually deliver on these values in a meaningful way? Once you have that foundation, you can communicate that promise and deliver on that value. It's our responsibility as founders not to dilute our culture, however, through change and growth. So we need to protect and reinforce those qualities through our employee experience. When you invest in your culture like a product, people problems start to evaporate. You'll attract the right people, retain them, and success for how we operate will follow. That's my one crucial thing. Thanks for having me. Hey everyone, my name is Lanny, and my one critical thing is to always move forward and nothing else. When you're in the process of starting a new business or just creating something novel, your day-to-day -day will primarily consist of things not going your way. Whether it's a no from a customer, the product not working like it should, a rejection from a potential investor, or something as little as marketing creative not looking quite right. Most of the time, it's going to feel like you're pushing a boulder uphill. And when it feels like that, you have to remember that your one job is to move forward and nothing else. You have to forget about the failures quickly because there's gonna be a lot of them. Learn from them, of course, and shrug off the rejections. Keep asking yourself, okay, what's next? And that's not easy for anyone. Nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to be rejected. But at some point you realize that it's part of the process. And by the way, it's a good thing because those learnings along the way become part of your IP. You failed, you figured out the right way of doing something, and now that's a valuable asset. Nobody else has that. So keep moving forward. And through that process, you're gonna feel discouraged. In those times, you have to lean on those that are helping you along the way, and you gotta cherish them. Cherish your friends and family for supporting you, even though they have to. Cherish the people that backed you, either by investing in you or opening doors for you, because God knows they didn't have to. And especially cherish your team, because they are, the, they are trusting you with their time and in some way their future. And they believe in the idea you're pursuing more than anyone else. And most importantly, cherish those times that you actually do move forward, whether it's signing a new customer, getting a product breakthrough, or landing a new critical hire. Cherish those moments because that's what's going to keep moving forward throughout the process. And that's my one critical thing. Thank you very much, and I wish you all great success. Thank you, Todd, Daniel, and the North Coast team for inviting me to talk about my one crucial thing. I really appreciate the opportunity. My name is Marilee Campamizi, and I'm a director in the Assurance Department at Markham. Markham is a top 20 accounting and advisory firm in the United States and employs over 2,000 certified public accountants. Certified public accountants are expected to know basically everything about business. And when I first started off in my career, these questions from clients and contacts intimidated me. I thought, I have to know all of the answers. This is my job. But I quickly learned that it's impossible to be an expert on everything. And so my one crucial thing is to identify and utilize your resources. The first resource is networking, both internally and externally. Not only do I have an R&D tax credit expert in our Chicago office, but I also have a list of bankers, attorneys, product design firms, and consultants that I can refer to my clients and business contacts when needed. The second resource is your technical guidance. Where do you go to find the information you need in your industry? 
For me, I often research irs.gov and Google white papers issued by big four accounting firms on accounting guidance. And we have internal tools at the firm as well. But I would encourage you to make the investment in those technical resources that keep you up to speed on the latest trends and developments in your own industry. The best experience is learning from your own mistakes. But while you're doing that, you can surround yourself with experts who have been through these situations before and can offer you guidance and have the right tools at your fingertips to use. I wish you the best of luck in answering the next challenging question that comes your way. Hi, I'm Mark Ritchie with 1809 Capital. Uh, I've been in the venture community for over 40 years, uh, the last 20 of, of that on the, on the investing side of the table. Um, the one critical thing I'd like to speak to today is this issue of the team. It's almost a cliche. You'll you know hear both investors and experienced entrepreneurs say it's all about the team. So what does that mean? You know, and 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 there are different perspectives on this. So let's assume that you know as a startup you you have you've developed great tech, you you're solving a a a critical problem that's proven in a very large market. So you can check those boxes, uh, and now you got to go raise the capital that enables you to execute on your vision and on the, you know, on the team's vision. Um, so you're able to get meetings with a, a significant number of investors. You're getting validation that uh, you are in fact in an interesting, compelling market, uh, but you're just not getting to the point of a term sheet, uh, which is a commitment in, you know, to, to invest in the company. You know, especially true in today's market, which is you know, obviously a difficult uh, fundraising environment. So I think that be now you get to a point where you got to do, you know, really a self-assessment because uh, the reality may be, and this is not an easy message to hear and it's frequent, and it's frankly not often delivered, is that investors, whether they be angels or they be institutional uh, VCs, simply, you know, you know, don't have the confidence that the founders and the team can effectively execute on the idea or on the concept and achieve, you know, um, you know, scale, you know, growth in the market and deliver the returns that they're expecting to receive. So, um, again, not easy, uh, but if you're just not getting to that point of, of, of capital being invested in the company, I think you really need to you know, be self-aware. Um, not many investors, if any, will ever you know, deliver this message, but take a hard look at the team and, and see if that there might be a factor there that is, you know, kind of the final box you got to check, the final, you know, you know, psychology you have to get over to get people, you know, investors to trust in you to execute on on your great idea. Thanks for listening. Uh, best wishes for success. Bye. Good morning. I am Wendy Jericho, Chief Investment Officer of Rivers Has Capital, a growth capital fund based in Westlake, Ohio. My one crucial thing is for entrepreneurs and managers of early stage companies to be authentic. By being authentic, customers will come and more critically, customers will stay. If you care about them and you care about your business, they will stay loyal and engaged and they'll sing your praises and be your own promotional tool through networking, in person and among social media. You'll build genuine relationships with them. Not only does authenticity make people better as individuals, but it also makes for stronger company culture and greater productivity overall. Additionally, authenticity is the foundation of trust. And if there's one thing every business needs, it's to build trust with its clients and stakeholders. Authenticity is achieved when brands are engaging directly with audiences, building connections that feel personal and making their customers feel heard and understood. Authenticity is having a genuine connection with your target audience. If you're not authentic, it's difficult for customers to connect with what you do. People want brands that they can relate to, companies who are just like them. Authenticity is about transparency and showing the world who you are and what you believe in. So think of authenticity as your company's personality. It should be unique to every brand out there. Finally, not every client is the right client. If you're not being authentic in your business, you're not going to attract the people whether that's clients, team members, employees, partners that you're going to thrive with.
If in sales and marketing you're not being authentic, you could be missing the mark when it comes to securing a solid customer base for the future. Our most successful portfolio companies understand that authenticity sells and is a critical virtue that leaders can demonstrate to attract the right employees, customers, and partners. Thank you so much for your time and for listening and best of luck to all of you. Well, thanks to North Coast Ventures for inviting me to share some thoughts. I'm Mark Morgenstern, managing partner of Blue Mesa Partners, co-founder of Within Three, author of The Soul of the Deal. The cornerstone of success in startups, marriage, parenting, life, it's all a deceptively simple principle. It's expressed in my maxim that an expectation unarticulated is a disappointment, guaranteed. Human beings aren't mind readers. What's obvious to you isn't obvious to others. So a key skill set of startup CEOs is to be your company's operational architect as well as chief storyteller. With that framework, you can make setting corporate goal expectations, whether they're large or small, memorable. Tell people what you want, why you want it, when you want it, what it accomplishes, and how each individual's task impacts team success or failure. Context and accountability matter. Small, consistent actions by you are much more effective than a single awe-inspiring speech. So here's a granular example. Encourage your colleagues to think of every email as team workflow. Clear and unambiguous language drives behavior. Subject lines establish topics and urgency level. Time sensitive, Project Mercury. At the top of every email, before getting to substance, identify your ask from each recipient. Yanwei, I need a one page memo from you by one o'clock PM Eastern Daylight Time today. I'll send your work product to our lawyers for approval by nine o'clock tomorrow. The customer proposal we promised to deliver by noon on Friday will incorporate their revisions. Francois and Samantha, actions required. Francois, respond to the question in paragraph number six by 5.30 p.m. today. Samantha, ditto for paragraph number eight. Then most importantly, confirm that every message you've delivered is heard, understood, and retained. The results may still disappoint you, but it should never be because people didn't know what you wanted. Say it with me now. An expectation unarticulated is a disappointment guaranteed. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Hi, my name is Corey Greendale. I'm a managing director at First Analysis and my one crucial thing is to do everything you can to maximize alignment. In customer relationships, there's no such thing as a contract that's great for your business that isn't valuable for your customer. If you sell to customers who aren't a good fit for your solution, or if your pricing isn't aligned to the value your customer derives, then this year's win is next year's churn, and it may be next month's negative reviews. But the importance of alignment is at least as pronounced when it comes to entrepreneurs and investors. Some would advise founders that if an investor offers you money under reasonable terms, you should take it, so you can get back to running the business. But a quick win can turn into a long-term disaster if you and your investors are not aligned on what you're trying to achieve. Before raising a round, we would recommend asking investors what success would look like for them three or five years from now. Would you rather have a 10% chance of selling your business for 1.8 billion and a 90% chance of going out of business, or a 90% chance of selling for 200 million and a 10% chance of a zero? The expected value is the same in both cases, but you'd deploy capital and run the business very differently in each case. There's no one right answer, but do some honest soul searching about what you think is right for you and your business. Make sure you take capital from investors who are on the same page. And when you raise a seed round, be sure the terms are set up to attract new investors who share that goal when you go to raise a series A. Entrepreneurs and investors can navigate through choppy waters together if they're aiming for the same destination, whereas misaligned companies risk running aground even in good times. Thank you for your time and for having me today. Hi, my name is Rebecca Bannon. I'm a journalist, an author, and a media entrepreneur. I've been writing about tech innovation for 20 years. And right now, my one crucial thing is the launch of my new book, Silicon Heartland, Transforming the Midwest from 
Rust Belt to Tech Belt. This is about the spread of Silicon Valley nationally and even internationally. It's a very important topic for today's innovation economy and our competition with China over technology in semiconductors, in AI, in robotics, and many other technologies. Today, what we're seeing is venture capital increasing in the heartland, and it's coming from the coast. So a real trigger point was the pandemic when remote working really took off and the talent moved in to places like Cincinnati and Columbus and Dayton and Indianapolis and Detroit and Pittsburgh and has spread beyond Silicon Valley. So I think my documenting this time in history is important. So I also documented the rise of China's tech boom and its entrepreneurship early on with my first book, Silicon Dragon, and a subsequent book, Tech Titans of China. I've been on this wavelength for quite some time now, and I'm still covering what's happening in tech innovation today, including even the impact of Silicon Valley bank collapse. Many new trends you can never be uh, stopping with tech innovation. It's always happening. And I like to be on the front lines and reporting what's happening and interviewing people who are making it happen. So again, thank you. And you can reach me at Rebecca at SiliconDragonVentures.com. Thanks a lot. Well, that was terrific. We want to thank all of our phenomenal speakers, not only for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us, but also for sharing their experiences and insights that help them get to where they are today. For those of you who are in attendance, you will receive a follow-up email with several items. First, a post-event survey. This is your opportunity to vote for your favorite presenter and share feedback and recommendations for future events. We'll also share a recording of today's session. Please feel free to share that with friends, colleagues, or other organizations that you may be connected with and feel may be interested. Thanks again to Buckingham Doolittle for sponsoring our One Crucial Thing event tonight, and thank you for tuning in. We hope you'll join us for another event soon.